if I was to describe the modern isekai genre in brief, the, the modern one, the one we have now with the current series in the past few seasons of anime, I described it as game-based in other world fantasy. It's not just fantasy where a protagonist is whisked to another fantastical world from our own, like with the John Carter of Mars novels or Alice in Wonderland or Connecticut Yankee of King Arthur's Court or, to use examples on the anime front, El Hazard and Magic Knight Ray Earth. This is fantasy where the characters are explicitly in a world that draws inspiration from games, from gaming. Sometimes by drawing the characters and their or their psyches into an actual game, a la Sword Art Online or Log Horizon, or a world which uses the language of RPGs, like uh, Konosuba or Grimgar, Ashes and Illusions. I would argue that if not the first of these, then one of the first of this particular genre was done in the U.S. in the 1970s by a woman. Specifically, that work would be Quag Keep, the book I'm reviewing this week. And this is the other work of our licensed gaming books, or tabletop role-playing related uh, books. So Quag Keep comes from Andre Norton, whose real name is Alice Norton. Norton published under a male pen name, because she got her start writing in the 1930s and continued on into the 80s. And when she got started, she was there was a significant amount of institutional misogyny in the publishing industry, particularly when it came to genre work, speculative fiction, and that sort of thing. Um, that made it hard for women to get published into SF under a female name. Other authors who did similar, who took similar steps would were, for example, James P. Tiptree, who also published under a woman and whose real name was Alice Sheldon. Um, the misogyny in the field of science fiction fantasy still exists. I mean, we had the sad puppies thing a couple years ago, and the usual suspects in that field are still around. Um, but the misogyny feels like it's shifted some. It's still it's still there. There's they're, they're still misogyny, but it's not like a publisher is going to turn down a work by a female author because they submitted their work under a female name. They, that the misogyny instead feels like it's more moved to the general societal background radiation as opposed to a constant um, where it's, it's there, but it, it's not at the point where it stops people from entering the field in the first place. Um, in terms of writing and getting a publisher to return your calls or to look at your manuscript. Um, now the barrier is, I would say, getting readers to, to once the publishers have gotten the book out, gets, getting readers to look at your manuscript. And in some fields, fields more than others, having a female pen name, uh, uh, being female, or identifying as female with your written identity works better than others. Um, so, yeah. In any case... What makes Quag Keep, if not the first, then one of the first gaming isekai novels, is it's in fact also the first Dungeons & Dragons novel, written after Andre Norton took part in a D&D game run um, for her by staff at TSR, I believe by Gary himself, Gary Gagax himself. Um, the group follows a, well, the, the book follows a group of D&D players who are whisked into the world of Greyhawk through a series of magical figurines and their con puts their consciousness in the minds of the characters depicted in those figurines with the minds of the original players and the minds of the characters, the adventurers, shifting in dominance over the course of the story. That said, once we get into the world of Greyhawk itself, and it is definitely the world of Greyhawk, loads of name checkings for various locations within the Greyhawk campaign setting with Finesse, um, the city of Greyhawk itself, um, Blackmore, you name it. Uh, we don't quite, the later introductions are less heavily name checked. We don't know talking about the Scarlet Brotherhood, I use um, that sort of thing. But, and also, it's a very much definitely a first edition, a D and D basic slash original D and D description where you have where the alignments are law and chaos, not good or evil. Though there is also the implication that law is good, chaos evil. Um, also, we have a, one of the characters in the party is a lizard man. 
um, which is, I mean, like, yes, you have, uh, you get Draconians and Dragonborn in later editions of Dungeons & Dragon, but you don't have a straight-up lizard man needs to be in water, that sort of thing, um, situation as a playable character right out of the gate in the core book even now maybe maybe they've got that in pathfinder second edition i don't have my copy of the core rules yet um but nobody like sticks that in the book right out of the gate so there's that but once we get inside there and we've fleshed out our and we've talked about the world we're in and our characters there's not much depth to the actual story the band of adventurers are bound by a geese, or geese, I believe it's a proper pronunciation, to travel from the city of Greyhawk to the titular keep, though they don't know that they're going to the titular quag keep. Quag, by the way, being swamp, so they're going to Swamp Castle, effectively. Across a variety of terrain, forests, mountains, um, desert, like a, particularly the uh, Sea of Dust. Um, they have to actually, met, like, one of the big things they run into is, okay, we're this is not just like a Sahara Desert type scenario. The the dust is very much sea of dust is very much liquid in its consistency, and they have to contend with that and find a way to overcome that. Um, all this time facing dangerous opponents across the way, um, dragons, other humans. At some point, some undead. They describe them as liches, but they're not like they're described as actual liches. Or at least not as we like to think of them. No phylacteries involved, no spell casting, that sort of thing. And when we meet the villain, we get a description of what their plan is and what they're doing, but not really why. There is a sequel, I'll get into that in a bit. But ultimately the motivations of why the trip is happening are not fleshed out well. What is fleshed out a little better, though, is the background and characterization of the adventurers whose the player's consciousness is in habit. The story is told through their perspective. Not the perspective of the players, necessarily, but rather the perspective of the adventurers. And the characters all have their own degree of backstory and prior adventures that they bring to the story, and each adventurer has to contend with the fact that there is a second mind inside their own, with their own memories and life experiences lingering in the background of their consciousness, and as they go through the story, some of this is very much okay, kind of balancing out, maybe coming to terms with the, the mind inside their mind. And it causes the book there's a lot of plot threads unanswered. It's actually a fairly short book as well. I'd almost describe it more of a novella than a full novel. Um, and it leaves hooks for a sequel that we got later in Return to Quag Keep, which is also sadly one of Andre Norton's last novels, but that's a topic for a later review. I did enjoy the book. Um, it's and it's definitely a, a moderately short read. Um, I was kind of going through it on my lunch breaks, and it didn't take too long to go through. It, it's it is definitely again the proto isekai in the sense of it's people from our world getting stuck into the dragged into a gaming related fantasy world, or not even just gaming related, just a gaming fantasy world. And it does something with that, with with what the characters are doing in the game. You can see kind of the context of Dungeons and Dragons in there, and maybe a little bit of manipulation of chance. But the isekai part of our like making it what makes it the difference between a gaming fantasy and a gaming another world fantasy comes up not as much as I'd like. Um, it is entirely possible from the sounds of things, likely that Return to Quag Keep will push more heavily into, okay, one of the people from our world, what's happening with them? But the book puts a lot more mystery onto what's with this other mind inside of the player character's mind up until the very end and things become clear-ish. I wouldn't describe it as clear, as actually clear, but clear-ish. The book is... Still in print, it is available on P as a paperback, as well as a Kindle version or ebook through various stores. Um, there'll be links to get it from Amazon in the show notes. Additionally, when I read this, I read it through the Kindle Limited program, where it is available for checkout digitally. If you don't have it, if your library 
local library does not have available for a digital checkout that way. Um, and there'll be a link in this um, doobly-doo to where you can get a subscription for that as well. Buying anything through those links helps to support the site. Thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed the show, please like and subscribe. And also consider backing my Patreon. Patreon backers get episodes up to one week early of this show and any future Let's Plays. Also, please consider backing my coffee. Uh, toss me a few bucks also helps support the show, and it's not a monthly obligation or anything like that.